Darren Graham. Yes, sir. Welcome to the Pickle Tato podcast <laughs> or whatever you want to call it. Okay. Are you going to wonder what Pickle Tato means? I was kind of wondering about that. Yeah, we're not going to tell you. Okay. So <clears throat> the reason I asked you down here is because I think you got a pretty extraordinary life. You might not think so, um, but I think you play a very important part of society. That a lot of people give a lot of, uh, you know, they say it, but I don't know if they really mean it or get it. You know, thank you for your service. You know, thank you for what you do. First responder this. You know, that's kind of like the catchphrase of everybody to make themselves feel good. But I don't think they really understand what it takes to do that. And I guess the kind of mindset that you have to have to do that for, <clears throat> you know, years upon years. So I've known you for quite a while, obviously. Um, there too. But what I don't know is a lot from the time I met you when, man, how long ago was that? 30, 30 years. 32 years. Man, it's been a while. Yeah. But from that time <clears throat> before that, I don't know too much about your childhood. I know a little bit, but I, that's why I'm kind of doing this podcast is try to learn more about people and people I think they have a good story to tell, whether they think they do or not, um, and just you know learn their background and okay. what makes them them. Starting off from day one, huh? You know, you don't have to be from day one. I'll okay. get to hear about all the gruesome, okay, you know, right. blood and guts coming out and everything. But okay, well, basically, where you where you grew up at? I'm from Lancaster, Kentucky. Gary County is the county. Mm. That's uh, south south west of Lexington. Country, mm. country, country. Grew up on a farm. Watch out for um, the bugs. Yeah, from uh, day one, basically, I started on the farm, and that's where I was until I was about eighteen years old. And what I learned in those years was. I don't want to be a farmer. All right. What kind of farm? You know? It was like cow, cattle uh, or? Cattle and tobacco. Okay. Yeah. I had um, my, basically every summer I'd go live with my, one of my grandfathers and, you know, I'd farm with him. And we, I started that, I couldn't even push the clutch down. I didn't weigh enough. Mm. You know, I'd have to stand up on the tractor in order to get the clutch to go down. So, so is that I, where you learned how to drive was a yeah, tractor? Right, wow. Right. Yeah. That was like eight, nine years old. So, uh. You know, he uh, to the day he died, he said I was the best best at the tractor driving. Yeah, you know, yeah no, that was that was a big deal. But uh, yeah, I grew up on the farm. Um, you know, we uh, lived. It took us about an hour to get to the closest McDonald's. Mm. That was a big deal going to McDonald's. Yeah, yeah, Lexington. That was a two lane road going into Lexington. Very curvy. It was a lot of road, <clears throat> but you know, uh, we we weren't um, well off by any means. My. Uh, my parents divorced when I was very young. I think I was like three or four or something like that. And uh, I lived with my dad. Uh, my dad got married pretty quick after that uh, divorce. And my stepmom is now the only surviving parent that I have. Mm. I'm still very close with her. Um, anyway, she was in my life from about age four or five on. Um, and it was her dad, my step granddad, I guess you would call him. Uh, he was the one that I would farm with all the time. He probably had the biggest impact in my life as far as growing up and learning how to do things, work ethic, you know. I mean, sun up to sundown, man. So growing up on the farm, I mean, what was like middle school and high school like? I mean, was it get out of school and go to work? I mean, is that kind of how it was? Or? Actually, yeah. I mean, when it was tobacco season, that was a that was an excused absence. Yeah. It was an expected excused absence. So come August, when everybody else is going back to school, usually, you know, we would get a couple of weeks there in the beginning of the of the summer. When when we get back off a of summer break, you know, they were very, gave us a lot of leeway with that because it's from a farming community. Mm. You know, I didn't live close enough to town when I was in high school to to do this, but, you know, we had to drive your tractor to, to school days, you know. You know, I've heard that. There's some still some schools in Ohio that do that. Yeah, it's a— uh, I'm sure there's other places, too, but that's one I've heard recently. I guess one of the podcasters— or, or not even podcaster, but um, was talking about the uh, drive your tractor to school and he recorded all you know all these kids pulling up and it was really weird. Is doesn't matter if it's a tractor or not, you still got the same social yeah. stacking. You know, right, right. If you had a brand new John Deere. I guess you were oh, you're you're, up. you're the, the shit, top, you know? man. You're the <laughs> so, top shiner. Yeah. You know, all I had was all we had was rusty old stuff. You know, mm -hmm. we didn't. Um, my my granddad was a basically a, I call him a tenant farmer for lack of the right wording, but, uh, you know, he rented the farms. He didn't own the farms. We had about 300 acres or so, between two and 300 acres, you know. I don't know, maybe a 100 head of cattle. I know we had about 30 acres of tobacco, and we he did it all by hand. You know, we were square bale. We come from a square bale family. That's yeah. before you 
before one, the rolls. One guy would go out here and roll, you know, 100 acres of, of hay, and no, we did square bales. Mm -hmm. So it was, a, it was a unique experience growing up, but I can't, can't complain about it at all. I mean, he was a good Christian man, so he taught me a lot. Um, as a matter of fact, he just passed, I guess we're probably talking three or four or five, maybe six months ago now. Mm -hmm. um, and he was 90. Four, 93, 94 when he when he passed. He's a good man. Johnny yeah. Walker. Johnny, Johnny Walker. Walker. That's a I'm well, pretty sure there's a I liquor think, called that. <laughs> I think anybody would be uh, glad to have up to ninety four. Sorry I'm catching flies no, here in the middle of the video, but it's fine. driving me yeah. nuts. Um, as long as you don't catch them off my face, we're good to go. <laughs> yeah. Uh yeah, you so still being in high school, I guess there wasn't much time to get in trouble or anything. Was oh yeah. To Dayton no. Or? no, there was all kinds of times. You know, once I got my license, you know, yeah, I still continued working on the farm um, during my downtime or whatever, but I played football, I played basketball, so I had practice, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And, of course, I had the girlfriends and all that, and that was, you know, interesting times. Did you pick her up on your truck? No, no, I had a car. I okay. had a car. I was driving before I was 16. I had my first car when I was 15. All right, I got to ask, what okay. was the first car? It was a... Because I hated mine. <laughs> it was an 80... No, mine was nice. It was an 81 Chevy Camaro. Really? Yeah. Big money. Yeah. Well, okay. It had a six cylinder. Oh, okay. All right. All right. You know, didn't have a scoop on the back. I hate to interrupt you in the mid, mid, but my current wife, when I when we first started dating, your only wife, friend. Yeah. Okay. Go my ahead. Only wife. Um, when we first started dating, she drove up to the house. And, you know, we were talking about where we're going to go, whatever. She's like, "Well, I'll come to your house, and we'll just leave from there." I'm like, "All right." Well, she pulls up in this Camaro, white, beautiful Camaro. It's like. Mid '80s car, you know, yeah. wasn't, wasn't like the '69s or something like that, but it was a super sharp car, you know. And uh, I was like, "Hey, you want me to drive?" She's like, "Yeah, you drive." You know, I'm like, "Okay." Well, I get in this car, I push the gas pedal, and it just <laughs> didn't do anything. I'm like, "Hey, something's really wrong with this car," you know. She's like, "No, it's it's fine." I'm like, "Something ain't right," and you could just hear it was like running on like four cylinders yeah, or something. Probably was a four cylinder. It was a four cylinder. I had no idea they even made four yeah. cylinders in Camaro. I was yeah. like, man, come yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> it almost defaces the whole it does. Camaro, you know. But yeah, that was, um, and I saved up for that. And and most of it uh, came from my own funding. You mm -hmm. know, my, my mom helped some with that. But um, my grandfather, uh, how he paid me, at least in the later years of my high school years, was he would give me a, an acre of tobacco and that was mine. Mm. So when it went to sell, I got that money. Well, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it was cool. Yeah, definitely built a worth a work ethic. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So anyway, uh, that was that was that. You know, and I, honestly, the first summer that I owned the Camaro, yeah, um, I crashed it. Yeah. As a matter of fact, it was between my junior and senior year, and uh, day two or day three of being um, out of out of school. Yeah, I hit a tree. Didn't move. So you must have been doing something before. Yeah, I was. I was, you know, we, we won't go there, but yeah, it was, it was, I have not always made the best decisions in life, especially yeah. when I was young. Sure. But uh, I lived through it. Mm. I got the scar to prove it. Car, uh, I lost the car for the whole summer because it took them that long to fix it. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so yeah, it was, it was good times. <clears throat> so, so well, Coming out of high school, did you have a direction that, well, you said at the beginning, you learned from being a farmer that you didn't want to be a farmer. So did that drive you into doing a different profession, or did you have something in mind that you wanted to do, or did you always know that you wanted to go to the field that you're currently in? Well, funny story. All right. So um, between my hometown, Lancaster, and Richmond, Kentucky, Richmond, Kentucky was our closest big city that uh, you could buy liquor in. Mm. So we frequented frequented that road between those two, you know, in, in the summer and, well, basically throughout the year. Um, back then, you know, times were pretty different. You didn't have to have IDs sure. or whatever. So we went that route a whole lot. And not once, not twice, but three times that I can recall, um, I came upon accidents on that, that stretch of road. It's a really nasty stretch of road. Um, and this happened mainly after I had uh, graduated. Now we're like freshman year of high school I go in, or for freshman year of college, going undeclared. I have no idea what I want to do. I'm just getting out of town. Right. I know that. And uh, I know I'm getting off the farm. I know that. Those are the two key where it didn't matter. So EKU was the place. It was the closest. <clears throat> so on one of those trips between home and EKU, when I was already enrolled, enrolled in college, I uh, rode upon a really significant accident. I can't remember, honestly, if there was one or two that was dead. 
Uh, but in that scenario, in that situation, I, I wanted to help. I didn't know how to help. Mm. You know, I was one of the few that would get out and actually go up and see what the heck's going on. What can I do when a lot of people were sitting in their car, sitting in their car, you know, whatever. Why is kind of taking a, so long? Right. Avoiding what the situation, you know, I'm out there at, in the middle of it trying to figure out what, what can I do to help, you know, until EMS got there. So that kind of stuck in my head. Um, kind of pointed me in a direction, you know, yeah, granted, at that point in time in my life, I'm I'm probably my, my first semester of college, and I hadn't figured out yet that you actually have to go to school. Mm. You actually have to go to class. You know, nowadays, you do it online, right? Right. A, a lot of classes. You know, Logan, he does, my son, he does a lot of classes online, and that's that's cool, but that wasn't that day and age. You had to right. actually go. So my first semester, I spent uh, testing the waters and figuring out yeah, this is fun, but uh, come the end of the semester when I didn't do so well, then it figured out, all right, I got to go. So um, uh, semester two, uh, trying now to figure out where I'm going to do, what I'm going to do, and uh, this this whole EMS thing is kind of in the background, and I needed five credit hours. I was My goal was 18 credit hours. That was, in my mind, and kind of the rules that the parents set on me, that was a full-time student, 18 hours, even though everybody else was doing 15. I didn't mm. understand the 18 part. So I had 13 wrapped up, and it's like, I need five more. Okay, what am I going to do? Well, I heard about this becoming an EMT, right? What's that all about? Guess what? That's five yeah. credit hours. Yeah, it's up perfect. Well, I had this incredible instructor. So I signed up for the class, had this incredible instructor. Uh, to this day, he's still in Madison County. He ran Madison County EMS for years. Um, anyway, I, he just hooked me. I mean, 100% hooked me. I went through that class, and it's like, I've got direction. Well, EKU at the time, this is, we're talking 1986, at the time had the, the top paramedic program in the state. And it still has one of the top, but only one of only of the degreed programs in the state. Um, so I dove into that and, you know, it took me a couple of years because I wasted a semester. Um, so basically to get a two-year degree, it took us three years by the time we did our field internship and all that. So one thing led to another, went through the EMT, got the EMT, Immediately enrolled in paramedic class, which is kind of unheard of because most people get their EMT and then spend some time in the, on, in the field to figure out, okay, I want to go to the next level. So get some experience. Then they go to the next level, which is the paramedic part. But I jumped right in and did it all, all at one time. So started in 86 and 89 is when I graduated and got my, my paramedic license. Mm. So that's me up to that point. So that was an EKU so did you know what area that you wanted to go to? Or I guess being a paramedic, from what I understand, your, your license in that state, or I guess there's some kind of test that you can take that it could be nationally? Right? Is that such a thing? Or? Well, at that point in time, no, no. that was not a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the National Registry didn't come out probably until maybe 20 years ago, and I've been a medic now for 35 yeah. or 33 or whatever. So you knew you were going to end up staying in Kentucky somewhere. Right. Yeah. yeah, so... <clears throat> Um, again, I'm dating myself, um, back in the eighties, there wasn't a lot of paramedics. This is a new field. Um, paramedicine was kind of invented in the, in the Vietnam war, you know? So the Vietnam war ended what in the early seventies, late sixties, early seventies, 71, 72. So the whole thing of being a paramedic and what is a paramedic kind of was invented in that war. So, you know, by the time I go through an 89, it's, it's a new, you know, it's a new career path. Mm. So just to put some numbers to it, they started with number one paramedic in the state of Kentucky in the beginning, and I was number 870. That was my paramedic number. Yeah. So I was the 870th paramedic that was licensed in the state of Kentucky. So that's a pretty low number. Yeah. There wasn't a lot of us around. <clears throat> so I did my field internship um, in Louisville, Kentucky. All right. So that we they gave us choices. You know, I think we could have gone to Lexington. We could have gone to Louisville. Um, a couple other places, but basically you had to go to large EMS services in order to, for it to qualify, you know, that, that's the agreements that EKU had set up or the uh, contracts that they'd set up for you. So, you know, I had like three choices. I was like, let's go to Lowell because I didn't want to go to Lexington because that's too close to home. Mm -hmm. Let's get a little further away from home, right? Yeah. Not that anything was wrong with home, but, you know, it's just like I wanted that to be where I was from, not not where I ended up. Right. So, long story short, ended up in Louisville. Um, 
So that was an internship. It was an internship. So how long does inter- internship last for? You know, it, it. I mean, I know it was a long, long time ago. But yeah, it was a long time ago. <laughs> so it took me three months to get through it. Okay. Um, I'm thinking, Bill, it was probably two hundred hours, mm. maybe something like that. I mean, you worked essentially full time for free yeah. for the summer. It's kind of the way it worked yeah. out. And you had to have so many skills in. You know, I had to intubate so many patients. I had to start so many IVs. I had to do all these. Different, you know, like subsets of numbers that had to be, um, that you had to accomplish through that time frame. So, so for internships, you know, and sorry for being the dumb guy here, but for internships, obviously you're not getting paid. So I always wondered how people survived without living with their parents or something like that. I mean, you obviously, if you're going to go away from where you're living at, you have to have a place to live and have to be able to eat. I mean, you got to get a second job or something to try to pay for your... Uh, That's you know. a yes. Yeah. Yes, I had a second job. Well, a first job, actually. So coming out of EKU, you know, one little piece that I neglected on that was my last year at EKU, I worked for UPS. I worked for UPS mm. third shift. So I would go in at 3 a.m. I would get off around 6 or 7 a.m. It was only three or four hours a day, unless it was Christmas and then holy crap. Yeah. <clears throat> but um, so when I left out of EKU... And came to Louisville, you know, I had to quit the UPS job, which, man, that was good pay, too. Yeah. Even for, back then it was. For huh? a student. Well, yeah. you know, it was 10 bucks an hour. Oh, yeah. Back then. 80, was, yeah. yeah, 88, 89. That was good money yeah, for a well, student. I mean, minimum wage was like two, <laughs> 225 or something back then. Or I don't know. I know it was like, wasn't much. So. I mean, I was almost to the point. It's like, forget this paramedic part. I'll just be sure. a, I'll just drive for UPS. Yeah. It's like, eh, maybe not. But <clears throat> so, all right. So we get to Louisville. Um one of my, two of my, three of my friends from EKU that was in the paramedic program with me were also moving to Lowell. So we end up roommating. Yeah. All right. Okay. One of them's from up there. And the other one was, he's from Paducah, actually. And he and I ended up rooming together. So we got to have a job. We got to have, you know, so we ended up working for a BLS service doing transports, basically, inner facility transports as mm-hmm. an EMT. That was just to kind of help pay the bills and pay the rent and, so, you know, that took place while we did the field internship. And then, as, I mean, as soon as you got your paramedic license, man, you were snatched up quick. You could get a job anywhere because there just weren't enough around. So even going into your internship, at what point did you get to the point where you've seen so much that you know, okay, now this is, I know what this is going to be and this is still what I want to do. You know, I guess what I'm asking, you know, certain wrecks that you get on or some things that you see and that type of, you know, those kind of environments are obviously can be pretty traumatic. So I would think at some point in your life, you'd be like, man, I, I ain't going to do this for us. I don't want to see this stuff yeah. or, or the opposite. Hey, there's people out there that need help. I'm, right. This is why I want to do this. Now. Right. And, and I think that's, does that happen during B the internship? Is more, um, Actually, it happened during my EMT internship. Okay. So as you're becoming an EMT, you've got to ride so many hours on an ambulance. And it's very uh, hands-off. You're basically just watching. But in uh, at the time, Madison County, they had some pretty good paramedics there because obviously EKU was there. They were churning out the best paramedics in the state, so they tended to migrate towards Richmond. Um, it was during that that I decided, you know, I uh, it's the servant part of it. That, um, you know, looking back on it, I, I realized that, that that met my servant need. You know, there was a need in me for some reason to serve mm. in whatever capacity it was. But um, I realized during that internship as an EMT that it's like, man, this is, you know, this is, uh, it takes it takes somebody, not everybody can do this. Sure. Most mm-hmm. people see blood and go, they go in the opposite direction. Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason, I, I migrate towards it. It's like, it's kind of a sickness, actually. But mm-hmm. um so, yeah, you know, uh, I know as an EMT, like on my second or third run ever, I actually picked up a human head. That thing's heavy. No. but Eight pounds? According well, to the Darren McGuire movie? He was a, fa- he was a fat guy, <laughs> yeah. so it was poor, probably more like 10 or 12. Bottom line is, is it, it uh, really intri- it was intriguing to me. You know, it's like, I want to know more, I want to know more, I want to know more. Um, so, yeah, in, in Louisville, I had a, uh, a great uh, time up there because I met some really nice people. Um, I was with my friends to start with, and, and Jefferson County EMS at the time, it's before they had merged the services together, Jefferson County EMS was one of the busiest, the busiest service in the state, and they were the most progressive service in the state. They would let you do pretty much anything. So um, had a really good time there, saw a lot of stuff. Um, I don't know what 
number out the gate it was, probably run number three or four or five. It was like like my second day. Um, I made a, an accident scene that it was a rollover um, on I-65, just south of just south of town, and it was a family, and there ended up being five fatalities in that. Um, that day was one of those kind of um, make or break days, um, especially the following day when the patient I ended up taking care of happened to be a 13 year old kid. Um, I got to see his autopsy. So it was, you know, again, kind of sick in a way, depending on your personality. But um, to me, that was so interesting to see. I took care of this kid yesterday. And today I get to see what really killed this kid. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that really kind of uh, started to comp compound on each other about uh, why, why am I doing this? And, you know, and it's uh, it still always comes back to the servant part. You're still helping people. And I think that's a foundational need that some people have. I have that need, you know, I need to help. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of what got me hooked. And um, it was a good, a good experience. So did you stay in that Louisville area after your internship? <clears throat> or? Excuse me. Okay. So <laughs> hey, we don't have to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> All right. So I, I, um, I met my first wife on that. Uh, I'm going to call it deployment because I don't know what else to call it on that internship. Yeah, yeah. Um, she was also going through her internship but she worked for Jefferson County EMS. So she had a lot of inroads, knew a lot of people, knew all the bosses, knew the lay of the land. Anyway, we're going to keep this part really short because, no um, yeah, I stayed in Louisville. So I did my field inter internship. I met her. We ended up getting married. I worked in southeastern Indiana for about three or four years as a paramedic. Um, Indiana? Indiana. So is there like a test or something you have to do to be licensed? In? Uh, it's reciprocity. Okay. So you got to gotcha. you got to jump through some hoops, pay Probably some money. Three or four states, I guess. Uh, no, actually, I could go to California, and there's certain things I'd have to do different. Okay. You know, like I might have to take a test. Um, they might require you to take a special whatever test on abusive pediatric head trauma or something like that. Like Kentucky sure. does that. Okay. So I got my Indiana. I went over to Indiana. Worked over there for three, maybe four years. Um, Saw some writing on the wall of situations at home that weren't going to go very good. I also saw the writing on the wall that this private service that I was working for was getting ready to go belly up. Started looking around. That's what took me to Northern Kentucky. Mm. So once I was in Northern Kentucky, I ended up uh, working. I heard about this service. They called it a tiered service. So the paramedics run around in cars. That was kind of cool. Excuse me. That was kind of cool. Um, you're not in the back of an ambulance until you're needed. So you're in this car, chase car, uh, responding on every call out there. And if they need you, you continue. Otherwise, you get canceled. So was there a station that you were based out of? Yeah. Or was you in the car the whole time? No, I was in a station. Okay. Uh, we would hang out, you know. And um, for instance, a chest pain would come out. We'd get dispatched with that, right? We EMS would get on scene. EMS being the BLS service would get on scene. And they would say, yeah, continue the medics. We'd jump in the back, hook them up on the monitor, do all the fun stuff, go to the hospital. Or they'd get there and say, no, this is chest pain. This guy's, you know, got nausea and vomiting. It can cancel. Mm. So we were only getting the the best. That's kind of not a good way to put it. We were getting the sickest, the higher acuity illnesses instead of your stub toes and stuff like that. Sure. So um, that was a pretty neat service up there. Basically, Boone, Kenton, and Camel Counties, you're from up there, so you can relate. Uh, pretty uh, condensed population, you know, pretty high population. Mm. Um, and for that area at the time, there was probably around 300,000 people. There was probably 30 ambulances and probably four, no, three paramedic units. So you saw a lot of stuff. And that's, that was going to be one of my questions. How many paramedics are they like required to have a paramedic per station or how does that, I mean, I guess, I guess what I'm getting at is what was your opportunities? Like, I mean, it sounds like you could pretty much go wherever you wanted in the state because there were so few of them. Well, there were so few of them, but we we also were not um, sought after quite yet because yeah. it was such a new, I'm an EMT, we're good, we got this, you yeah. know, that kind of good old boy system. Sure. Um, so the whole paramedics coming in were like stepping on a lot of toes because we could do a whole lot more procedures. Well, Fred, who's been in EMT for 30 years, you know, running a volunteer squad, and, and then comes the paid paramedic that could do a lot more things. There was a lot of integration there that uh, you had to be – you know, kid glove it a lot of times mm. and be patient with it. But yeah, um, once 
Uh, once I was up there and now, I mean, it's there's paramedics everywhere. Every department has their own paramedics. Well, back then, there was only three chase cars in three counties chasing all these ambulances, right? Mm. So you got to see a lot of stuff. So times have changed a whole lot now. Now every, like I said, every uh, every department up there has one or two, sometimes two or three paramedics on the same ambulance. It's crazy, which wow. water, waters down the system yeah. to the point that they don't turn out paramedics like they used to. So is that like a, a seniority thing of whoever's on charge, I guess? Like you said, you had maybe two, maybe even three paramedics on the, yeah. on the same ambulance. Like. I'm sure there's some kind of internal conflict in there and who's going to be in charge of what or before uh, you even go out, is it like, hey, you're you're the guy that makes the decisions and we're here to back you up? I mean, is that all discussed before the yeah, shift team starts? Yeah, okay. Usually it's based on seniority and or credentialing, you know. Um, usually you're probably going to have one EMT. He's going to be, uh, I mean, all are equally important, don't get me wrong, but, you know, the EMT is usually going to be the, out of the drives and you're going to have a couple paramedics on a lot of these ambulances and it just depends on, you know, if you, me and you're in the back and I've been a medic for 30 years and you've been a medic for 10, you're probably going to be doing most of the work and I'm going to be watching, sure. you know, so. Yeah. And that's not the same with all departments, but as a general rule. Yeah. So <clears throat> getting to the point where I want to, well, I'm interested in, I'm interested in all of it, don't get me wrong, but so we're, you go up to, to your career, you know, you, you've been doing a paramedic for quite a while, then all of a sudden you get some kind of bug who who placed this bug that we're going to talk about? Was that something you always thought of, or is that somebody somebody approached you with it, or how how did that? Well, so um, I guess as your career advances and you get to the point, you know, I mean, so I was a street paramedic for many years, and now I've been a flight paramedic for another seventeen years. So half my career I've been flying. All right, and the acuity level of the flight paramedic is so much higher than that of a street paramedic. Just the acuity level. You know, you don't call a helicopter for anything. Right. Well, you shouldn't. As a rule, sure. you know, the acuity is a lot higher. It's a stroke. It's a heart. It's trauma. It's somebody that potentially could die. That's the way it's designed to work because that's a high dollar asset that you're tying up. Sure. All right. With that being said, um, so I've flown. So that was the next step up up on my career ladder was, was starting to fly prior to flying. You know, I had done it all. I'd been in the back of an ambulance. I'd run an ambulance service. I had been the director. I'd been the chief of operations of a large service in Northern Kentucky. Um, started flying, flew, still flying to this day. You know, that's my full-time job. And and the bug that you're talking about is this corner. It's probably this deputy corner business. Is that what you're talking about? No, I was talking about the flying part. Oh, the flying yeah, part? Yeah, we're going to get in the corner ah, thing. Yeah. Okay. Like a lot of people for aviation, it's a bug that either – you're so curious and curious for me anyway. I was like, okay, that'll never happen, but man, that'd be so cool to do that. And then when you do it, then you're hooked, you know, yeah. you got the bug. So I was just wondering if that was something that you always wanted to do, or is that something that the opportunity came? It's like, yeah, that'd be pretty cool doing this. I mean, I guess what I'm asking is, did you pursue to, to go do para, you know, flight medic, or was that something that just popped in your lap? And you're like, hey, let me try this out. Well, it's kind of popped. Yeah. It kind of, Oh, okay. So I was at the top of my career ladder as far right. as I felt with ground EMS and running a service. Sure. And I was getting pretty bored with that. Quite and not honestly. even that. I remember back then how stressed you were over it. Yeah. A lot of stress, a lot of, man you know, dealing with people is a lot harder. Yeah. <laughs> On a management right. scale is a we lot had, harder than. We had about 100 employees. Yeah. All right. That was high stress. And yeah. I was pretty much, I was the director, then the chief of operations. It was a stressful job. And I was looking for what can I do. You know, I was starting to have those thoughts of, man, how long can I last at this? Because, I mean, high stress. Long story short, um, I was also working part-time uh, at UK Athletics. I mean, as you know, I'm a huge UK fan. Sorry. It's just the way it is. Um, Everybody's so, got their downfalls. I know everybody. You know, Bama, Roll Tide, whatever that means. <laughs> I don't even know. Is there any tides around here? Yeah, there's a roll tide over here. I don't there's even a know roll what, tide that, over what does that mean? Well, roll I'll explain tide. to you. Okay, all right. I'll explain it to you tomorrow when we're playing LSU. <laughs> okay. All right, so where was I? Uh, um, Talking about the stress job yeah, and what made yeah. you go. Okay, so I'm working for UK Athletics, and um, this is a job that I enjoy. So what we do is we basically were employed by the university to work football and basketball games, right? I mean, who wouldn't love to do that? Yeah. Even if you're not a huge UK fan, sure. you're getting in free Rupp Arena, you're getting in free, mm. uh, you know, yeah, you're working a little bit, getting a lot, of, a lot of food, a lot of food gets thrown at you. Um, so, um, I was working one day in one of the EMS rooms with, with a lady that, uh, was a nurse, you know, each, each first aid room had 
two or three medics, an EMT, and, and a couple nurses. All right, that's each EMS room. And Commonwealth Stadium, now Kroger Stadium, UK, I think we had six, six uh, different first aid stations, EMS rooms. Sandy Wells, who I might not have should have said her name. I love her. Anyway, if she ever hears this, she'll she'll say kudos. Um, we can always hit a beep button if you want us to. Okay. No, she, an incredible lady. Um, at the time, she was running, uh, she was like the director of PHI Kentucky. PHI is Petroleum Helicopters Incorporated. It's like petroleum, What what is that? Well, basically... You flew the oil rigs for the beginning the, of their... The, that, was, that was one uh, leg of their business. The other leg of their business was EMS. You know, they just didn't change the name. They didn't mm -hmm. call it EMS. So, so PHI or medical. She looked at me. We worked together for one whole season. At the end of that season, she's like, hey, I like you. I, said, well, I like you too, Sandy. <laughs> she's like, no, I mean, I, I want you to, I'm opening a new base. Are you interested in flying? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in flying. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm already flying because at the time I was working for a service called, at the time, LifeNet Kentucky. But I was part time, you know. I was just uh, starting to dabble in it. So it was more of a fixed wing thing. Where no, no, it was a helicopter. It was okay. helicopter yeah, um, I flew out of Frankfurt first, and then Mount Sterling. All right. So, um, but Sandy, uh, this is like year two of me flying. She's like, "Hey, I'm opening a base." You know, at that point in time, I was driving all the way to Frankfurt, or I was driving all the way to Mount Sterling. Um, she said, "I'm opening a base in Williamstown, Kentucky. I'd like for you to be the the base manager." And it's like. Hey, how do I like, do that? <laughs> how do I do that? And she's like, well, you, you've got management already in your background. I know what you're doing, you know, because she'd kind of check, check me out. She knew that um, I was already a director and everything else. So I said, yeah, tell me about that. So I was with PHI for eight years as their base manager. Um, they ended up closing that base in Williamstown. Actually, they moved it. They moved it too far away for me to drive. And it's like, I'm out. Mm. Um, but I wasn't out until... Um, the service that I fly for now says, hey, we're opening a base in Williamstown, Kentucky. And it's like, wow, deja vu, right? Mm. But it's all about me being close to home. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. So I checked this company out. Their safety record was was pretty impeccable at the time. It had it had not been always that way, but it, they had really made a lot of safety, uh, safety advances. Um, so I've been flying with them ever since. So that's where I'm at now. Um, anyway, back to Sandy. Sandy's since retired a long time ago. I mean, now we're talking the span of 17 years wow. between the three. So I've been to all three um, flight services in the state of Kentucky. Okay. So I've been around a lot of first responders and, you know, me with my background, it kind of goes in line in line, you know, hand in hand with it. If an outsider was to come into an area where there's a bunch of paramedics talking and some of the things that they say and when they're talking about – runs that they've done if somebody wasn't part of that community and they walked in there they'd be like man you guys are so morbid you know and being in the military some of the stuff that we've done you know we'll talk amongst ourselves and we'll kind of <coughs> laugh about stuff right. that normal people wouldn't laugh about and i th think that's more of a coping mechanism and it's kind You're of a way to right. make light of it so it's not so hard on it. i mean is that something that you know that that you've seen, or how, oh, do, you, how do you deal I'll with all the stuff that you've seen? Yeah. I'll participate in that daily. Sure, yeah. sarcasm. You know, that's <laughs> another uh, another language there that I speak is sarcasm, yeah. and it. I think a lot of it comes from the crap that we see, the crap yeah. that you've seen in the military too. Um, yeah, um, if you're an outsider looking in and you hear some of these conversations, it's so. So we have to be very um, conscientious of that. You know, I mean, yeah, in front of my wife, I'll, I'll talk that way because she's used to it. Right. Been together a long, long time. But uh, in certain, uh, you know, in certain venues, you you just don't want to talk that way. Sure. You don't want to bring that kind of, yep. you know, uh, not it's not for everybody. Because if it was for everybody, there'd be a whole lot more people doing it, right? Mm -hmm. And now there's a national shortage of EMS workers. You know, there's a national shortage of of military. I mean, it, people just aren't getting into those fields quite like they used to. So yeah, it is a coping mechanism. Um, I think if you uh, you got to keep it light because if you don't. It'll take you down pretty sure. quick. Yep. Uh, you can't, you don't, you won't last. And, you know, and I've predicted it for years. You know, I can, I, I've trained so many new people through the years. I can tell, you know, right up front, give me a two or three weeks with them and I can figure out, is this a, a lifetime job for you or is this a, I'm just passing through? No. 
you know, because um, when you see some of the things, you know, and 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 honestly, it it, it kind of gets, um, I don't know, it kind of rubs you raw sometimes. I guess when you've been doing it as long as I have, you know, I can I can get past it, and not worry too much about it. But I can't tell you how often you meet somebody. Oh man, I bet you've seen some really bad stuff, huh? Mm. What's the worst thing you've ever seen? Yeah. And I'm thinking, like, yeah, let me dig that up. Right. You know, I mean, it's taken me 30 years to forget that. Sure. And here you're wanting me. So, um, there, there's a lot of, you know, it's a constant state of healing. I think. Um, there's a constant state of process and let go, process and let go. Um, and and when you're around your coworkers or those in healthcare in general. You know, I mean, my one of my daughters is a is a nurse. I've got another daughter that's an OT, and of course, growing up around me, they're used to the, you know the morbid crap, and mm-hmm. they actually ask for it and want to see it. Oh, mm-hmm. let me see the pictures. Um, they understand it, but healthcare as a, as a general rule, you know, that's how we cope with it is is to kind of downplay it to keep it light. No, even though half of society out there would be totally offended by what we might say absolutely after we left your scene yep. you know it's like he did what how did what <laughs> he said what yeah how did he get that in <laughs> okay well anyway yeah. um so yeah let's go yeah that's one thing i did want to break up bring up because <clears throat> i've been on the other side of that where i've heard people talking it wasn't any situation that i was in but i was there at the situation that happened and i overheard those guys talking and you know the family was very close by i'm like man how can you guys talk no, like that you no, know or right. even even think something like that but then obviously being around you my you know a lot of my life yeah you know it kind of makes sense and then especially stuff some stuff i've you know seen and been through when you start making fun of it it's definitely a way to talk about it without talking about it right you know right, what i mean right you're exactly and how right. else are you going to talk about it? you're going to sit there and cry with your buddies all right, day no no, no. you're going to make fun of it and over time it starts to lessen, 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 and, you know, I get it. And um, that's just what I want everybody else to understand, too. If you if you do see, by some chance, that going on, yeah, it ain't people where they're— <laughs> It's not, not disrespect. It's not disrespectful. No. It's it's their way to be able to do what they're doing to help you guys out. So, you know, you just need to understand that. Yeah, and, and us, you, you know, we need to make sure that we're doing it in the right sure. setting. You know, I mean, there's, go back to the station and do that. You know, yep. do that around the corner. Um, I mean, you know, being married to a nurse yourself and military that you've seen and being around me for over half your life, it's like, yeah, we. it's just the way we cope with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, good point. Very good point. So the opportunity that popped itself up recently. <sighs> okay, now we're on the corner. <laughs> now we're on the corner. How does one become a, a coroner? I mean, what kind of um I don't know what that is. Let's take a break real quick. Okay. Now that we're trying to get these flies out of here and planes flying overhead and the mysterious UFOs that are going right. <laughs> what's this flashing lights over there? They aren't really there. Um yeah, so we're getting ready to talk about uh what brought you to the corner. And I guess what I was asking before we stopped was um how do I I thought, you know, me not knowing anything, I thought maybe that was a school that, you know, like a track that you had to have, you know, you know, you go to a four-year degree for a corner. I didn't know what the process was to get to that. I mean, what kind of requirements are for that? I mean, do you... Well, believe it or not... How does that work? (laughs) Believe it or not, it's pretty easy. Yeah. I wouldn't think so. Well... Just just knowing a corner, I mean, I would think that... I don't know. What so I'm okay, all right. So let, let's let's lay it out here for you real quick. Yeah. There's a coroner in that person in the state of Kentucky. Anyway, now I don't know how it works down I here. Think in it's Alabama. not the same. It's one person. It's one person in each yeah. county who's who's voted in. Right. They're right. voted in. Okay. Right. And they, through county government, can hire X amount of deputy coroners based on the need. You know, based on the how many people average death they die. Yeah. yeah. The death volume. Sure. All right. So anyway. So in Boone County, which is the county that I'm a deputy coroner in. All right. So how did this all come about? Uh, a friend of mine called me up and said, "Hey, you want to be a deputy coroner?" It's like, "Well, tell me about that." Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, I've done one line of business for so long, right? And it's not that I'm ready to get out of being a paramedic or getting ready to be done with flying, but I am interested in doing something a little different. Um, so this is a way to uh, supplement income. And take a little different view on things. Okay. So 
They ask me, hey, would you be interested in this? Sure, I'd be interested in it. Tell me about it. So basically to be a deputy coroner, i.e. eventually a coroner, if that be the path I go, um, you have to go through a 40-hour training. You have to be past the test. Well, can I stop yes, you right there? Sure can. Do you have to have a, do you have a med- no. medical background? No. Really? You can be okay. a coroner. You know, no, you, I'm not going to be a coroner. No, I, well, I understand. <laughs> but you do not have to have. Now, granted, it makes sense. Right. You know, it makes sense that um, you have some common sense about the body and da 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 and you don't have to learn all this from scratch. So, for instance, our coroner, she is a nurse, and she's got all kinds of letters behind her name, you know. And she's been a coroner now for probably three terms. And all of her deputies are either paramedics or nurses. So, you know, she identified early on, I'm not hiring anybody to do this because I don't want to teach them what lividity is, for instance. You know, lividity is a condition of the body as it breaks down. Mm. So, anyway, so most, if not all, are going to be have some uh, some background in, in medical, whether it be EMS or nursing. Um, it's not a requirement, but it's, it's the, the easy way to – to bring in a bunch of training without ever having to be trained in it. Okay. So once um, once you're hired, you know, I had to go through this whole, you know, raising my hand and uh, swear da 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 with the government because I am a, uh, a government employee, Boone County government employee. Um, that's who pays me. And by the way, that's why I'm, you know, it's one of the reasons why I did it is it's to supplement income. You know, I'm at this point in life, I'm not looking for volunteer jobs. Sure. I'm just not. I'm too old, too tired for that. Mm. You know, it's not that I don't want to give because I think I've given for a lot of years. Um, so anyway, it's, an, it's it's the other side of what I've always done, right? I've always tried to save a life, you know, being a paramedic. But now I'm, okay, well, that didn't work. <laughs> so what's the other side of it look like? And there was a TV show way back in the 80s and 90s called Quincy MD. I remember that. <clears throat> that yep. show intrigued me from way back then as a matter of fact i thought about getting into forensics when i was going through the paramedic program at eku but it took a lot more schooling i'm talking like eight years at the mm-hmm. time and it took smart people i ain't got eight years and i'm not that smart right so probably wasn't a good thing for me mm-hmm. but this is another avenue for me to be able to you know it kind of fulfills that need for me to serve and it's a totally different angle it's an angle that Honestly, I didn't know I was going to get into until I was into it. You know, as a paramedic, you kind of avoid those death situations. First of all, you do your best to 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 keep that from happening. But once it happens, you know, it's easy for me to walk away as a paramedic because I'm not responsible to tell that family what all happened and what all blah, 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 blah. You know, that the police are going to do that. The coroner is going to do that. Um, my job is, well, I, I tried to save them. I couldn't save them. I'm out. I'm gone. You know, now I got to go deal with that back home. Mm. All right. So this has brought a whole new side to it because <clears throat> this makes me, um, be sympathetic, be empathetic more so than I've ever had to be before. Um, you know, in the past, yeah, I've had to deal with death in in families, but, but not as a primary, I wasn't the primary guy. I was mm. a secondary guy. Yeah. I'm really sorry about your loss, you know, and da 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 and, and then heading back to the ambulance or to the helicopter or whatever. But this, I'm actually in your house. Yeah. I'm there, you know, until your parent is driven away. Yeah, I didn't even realize that. I yeah. thought a coroner's job was basically just to pronounce somebody dead, say, okay, yeah, don't have to work anymore. Well, I, I, I didn't even put two and two together to yeah. realize that you're the ones that actually <clears throat> talk to the families about that stuff. So, and again, every state might be a little different, Mm -hmm. you know, I can only tell you how Kentucky does it, but in Kentucky, you know, coroner or deputy coroners, first of all, they carry a lot of weight, believe it or not, even though, I mean, you know, I've been told that they're the highest ranking officer on any scene, you know, I mean, I'm not a sworn in officer per se, but I am sworn in. Mm -hmm. Um, So a body don't move until I tell you to move it. I mean, there'll be 28 police officers standing around. And there ain't a one of them going to move that body until I tell you to move it. Mm. Because our job is death scene investigation. It's not just pronouncing, you know, good luck, sorry about your loss, send, shipping them off. You know, it's about death scene investigation. So every scene comes with its own nuances. You know, I mean, how long 
What was the temperatures? I mean, there's so many things that I had no idea that this was uh, even looked at. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I pronounce, you know, we pronounce. Um, so the timestamp on that death certificate is going to be whatever that coroner says, mm. you know, even though they might have been dead three weeks earlier. Sure. But it's what time the coroner says is the death. So, so there's about a nine, ten page report that I have to do on every call. Um, we have to, we have to look that body over upside, downside, you know, strip them down. Uh, tox screen. We do a tox screen on scene. You know, I'm going to draw blood. I'm going to draw vitreous from, from the eyes. I'm going to do a lot of things that, so there's a lot more to it than just saying, Hey, yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry about your loss. But it all, also has taught me a whole lot on the, Hey, sorry about your loss side, yeah. the empathy side, the sympathy side. Um, uh, it's, it's an important because you're the first point of contact. You know, I mean, I'm sitting at the house waiting on the next of kin to get there, mm. right? I'm the guy that we're the we're the people that's that's talking to that next of kin, and they've got a ton of questions. You know, you know, you yeah. know how that goes. You got a ton of questions when your parent passes away, uh, when your next, you know, your relative or whoever. So, well, so can you pronounce these flaws dead soon? Man, they are they're relentless. Yeah. So obviously, you can't see exactly where we're at, but we're out. In my man cave garage. Yeah, what a man and, cave. Uh, for some reason, they just started coming out in the next last couple of days. Well, it's because it's cold outside. They're coming inside. That's right. That's we right. need to make it cold in here. We'll wear sweaters and stuff next yeah. time. But uh, sorry, I interrupted. That's okay. Where was I? So, um, very, uh, it's a side of the business that I really know very little about. I'm learning. Um, I actually go to the class myself the first of uh, the year, like the third week of January. Um, so for right now, my coroner signs off on all my work. Um, so I'll go out and do an investigation. I'll have an ongoing dialogue with her if there's any questions that I can't come up with answers for. Um, she'll review my my paperwork, and she and I will sign off on that to go forward, but she has to sign off on it ulti ultimately. But then come January, once I go through the 40-hour death and scene investigation coroner's class, then I will be, you know, a legal yeah, for lack of a better term, deputy coroner. Yeah. So you're probably going to think this is a dumb question, but I don't think it's a dumb question. And I think I know the answer, but would there ever be a time that you're working for your company that you're at flying and you get to the scene and you're like, okay, um, this person is no longer living. Can you flip your hat and be a coroner since you work for the state still? Or do no. they have to call a total separate no, person? No, they're going to call this total separate person. Right. So we can, in the field, I'll put on my EMS hat, um, with medical control, I can pronounce somebody. I can say they're dead. Mm -hmm. Now, does that timestamp that I said they're dead? No, it's going to be the coroner's timestamp that goes on the death certificate. Okay, but as a paramedic, there's a, there's a litany of... Uh, check boxes, mm -hmm. and if you meet all those check boxes, I can say he's dead, no. you know, and I can move on. Okay, so but no, that I, I was I wouldn't want to cross those lines. <clears throat> I always assumed like if you were in a ambulance and you know, in all intents and purposes, everybody knows you're dead. But I, I didn't know if there was a requirement to continue CPR until you got to the hospital until somebody says, "Hey, you know, stop." No, so. the, the, at least our state, state of Kentucky, they have they have a, a list of rules that okay, if this, 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 and this, and you've done this, this, and this, and there's been a systole, you know, a flat line on the EKG for X amount of minutes, then you can call them. Mm. You know, okay, so if I do that, I'm going to do that on the scene. All right, I'm not going to take off with them. Um, I'm going to do that on the scene, and then they're going to call the coroner, and the coroner is going to come out, and the coroner is going to do a death scene investigation on them. And I don't have to even stay for that as the EMS provider. Uh, the police will stay with the body until the coroner gets there. So, the, so there's never a point in time that the that the body is left alone. Okay, because gotcha. you never know. I mean, it is death scene investigation, right? So mm -hmm. people can screw with stuff. You know, if right. it's one of those, you know, if it's a crime scene, yeah. whatever. So, right. anyway. So it's a whole new, new, whole new game for me that I'm learning a lot about. That that's uh, it seems like something you're going to enjoy and want to stay yeah, in for a while. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, honestly, it was kind of hard in the beginning because I saw some crap right up front, and it's like, ooh, why am I, I doing? I don't know about this. <laughs> why am I doing this? This right. is the stuff that I used to walk away from and didn't have to deal with, and mm -hmm. now, but you know, it's again, it fulfills that that servant need that for whatever reason in my brain I have, and and it is interesting, and so yeah, it's a I can see me doing this. I mean, this is never going to be a primary job. 
I don't ever see me running for coroner of Boone County. Sure. But, you know, this is a, this is a good way to serve and, and to, you know, be able to help people in a way that I haven't been able to help them before. So yeah. Yeah. going back to the flying thing it just popped into my head. <clears throat> How is it to have somebody else in control of what that helicopter is doing? What I mean by that is obviously when you're flying at night and bad weather, you know, is there ever a time that you've been like, hey, man, I'm not, you need to go land or, or something. I mean, is there, has there ever been a time that you've had to stay, say something that you thought a pilot was doing that, that you, you thought was unsafe and he's like, hey, you know, I just, or do you just go along for the ride? No. Yeah. yeah. So um, that's a big deal what you're talking about. And that's a whole chapter. <laughs> um, but basically, yeah, it's crew coordination. And, and um, I have as much say whether that helicopter goes as the pilot does. Mm -hmm. Um, in our company, we call it 51%. Everybody carries that 51% card. And at any point in time, I can say, whoop, we're done. Mm. Or my nurse can say that or the pilot. Um, but yeah. And that could be for anything, right? Even, could be for anything. Even crew rest. Absolutely. Even if you don't even reach crew rest. If you, hey, man, I'm more out. I'm yeah. probably not safe to do this. I can walk outside and say, ah, it's cold. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to go today. Now, you're, you're going to answer to somebody. I'm, what I mean, I don't mean answer to somebody. There's going to be some accountability there. Right. You know, if if the minimums were there for you to fly and you say, no, I'm not going to fly, nobody's going to question you then and there. Right. Tomorrow when I come in for shift, my my boss is probably going to say. Why didn't you bring a sweater? Hey, well, yeah. <laughs> hey, tell me about what happened yesterday. Sure. Well, you know, I had a toothache and it was cold out and that really accentuated my tooth. tooth. Good enough. That's all I need to hear. You know, so no. Um, but yeah, I have had to call out pilots before just like, you know. That's, you know, been doing it for so long. And, but for the most part, the crew coordination is, is incredible you, because you get to know these people on a personal level. Sure. I'm living with them. Mm. I'm with them for, you know, 24 hours at a time. I'm with pilot 12 hours at a time. I've got the same pilots over and over and over again. And uh, we know each other. And, you know, I know that this pilot, you might have to tell him, nah, let's not do that. Okay. You know, and he'll say, okay. No. And likewise, you know, I might have another pilot that's, uh, Wow, you know, it's probably going to get foggy tonight, so we ain't going nowhere. Okay, yeah. you know. So it, it takes a lot of uh, communication is key and not being pushed around, you know. I mean, you got to sometimes you got to stay on your ground, especially if it's a newer pilot. Um, you know, most of our pilots come from the military, and the military teaches you to be confident. I mean, it does. I want you to be confident, right? Um, but at the same time, I want you to, you know, there's common sense and there's there's rules and there's, it's not just you, but it's us, you know. You control whether I live or not sure. in this given environment or this situation. And, yeah, you think you can handle it, and I bet you can. But you know what? Yeah, I'm not, not feeling it today, so 51%. Yeah. I've probably called that twice ever because mm. you don't have to. I mm -hmm. can just look at the pilots and say, hey. They're like, yeah, I get it. We're good. We won't go. Okay. That's good. Yeah. yeah. It's a good relationship. So let's get talking about your family a little bit. I'm extremely impressed of, and I've talked to some other people when doing this, talking, you know, talking on this little podcast thing that we're doing about uh, parenting and stuff. And I guess I'm kind of amazed when I see that it's done right, you know, <laughs> because, you know, like I said before on here, um, I don't think I did a very good job, even though the outcome was way better than I thought it would have been. Meaning my son has turned out way better than I thought he should have, having, you know, a parent like me. And the reason I, what I mean by that is <clears throat> not being there hardly ever. And when I was there, I really wasn't there. You know, I was, you know, word I used before was not present, just kind of floating through until the next appointment or something came, you know, because I know I was going to be leaving soon. So watching you, how do you handle uh, your kids and stuff like that? We're going to get into, but I basically want to talk about your family life and how they deal with, you know, you being gone so much as you're as you're gone. <laughs> My absence, right? And when the whole discipline comes in, you know, you know your your wife's there and you're gone, and something happens, and you're dealing with the stuff you're dealing with at work, and she calls you, and hey, they're not doing blah blah blah. And then, I mean, does that ever pop up where she expects you to call home, or does she just deal with it on her own, or? Um, I mean, they're a lot older now. I'm talking back. Yeah, know. these are very good questions. And um, first of all, I've I've got a, an incredible wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
you know her pretty well. Mm -hmm. Um, she's put up with a lot of shit. Sure. Well, they all do. Yeah. Because, um, you know, I've worked, you know, looking back, I average 140, 150 hours a pay period. Mm -hmm. You know, that's 70 or 80 hours a week. That's a lot. And I've done that my whole life. Yeah. You know, some call me a workaholic. Yeah, I probably am. Um, no, I am for sure. But she, she's, um, we've had a very good relationship and I've always been in a situation to where we have, we have boundaries, obviously, you know, the kids have boundaries. So I've always had boundaries and, um, you know, being raised in the church, I think has a whole lot to do with it. Uh, number one, number two, uh, having a strong parent relationship as far as our, you know, she and I, our relationship has been very strong throughout the years. Mm. And I think that makes it easier because it really, they ain't going to get by with something with her, right? you know, and then me have to deal with it. Likewise, they're not going to get by something with me and she's going to have to deal with it. We're, we're pretty universal in our thoughts as far as how to raise kids. And, you know, we haven't done it all right. You know, I mean, we, we've learned. Yeah, nobody does, but, you know, you can definitely make mistakes in there that, oh, man. that, that you can't turn back from, yeah. you know. And it's, like I said before, I think it's fascinating to see people who I consider have done it right. I mean, all you have to do is look at the outcome of where they're at right now, you know. There's a lot of kids in their <clears throat> their same age group oh. that are way gone, yeah. and they will not come back unless something very significantly happens in their life. So I think um, I wouldn't call it luck. I mean, I'm I'm a true believer that you're what you become is have to do with basically yeah. from the time you're about <clears throat> five six years old until you're about thirteen fourteen. Right. That's where you're molded for the rest of your life for oh, yeah. the most part. Now obviously yeah. you're going to have outliers there. That are going to have some some changes in there, but for the most part, those years are so impressionable, and who they look up to, and who they want to be, and say, "Yeah, I don't like you right now because you're you're an asshole." And you, right. you told me I couldn't do this. Right. Kiss my ass, or you know, in their mind, whatever they're saying. But later in life, they realize, you know, yeah. I'm probably where I'm at because of right. because of him and her. You know what I mean? So that's I was just wondering, you know, what kind of disciplinary things that you guys funny stories or anything uh <laughs> wow some kid comes in and does this and they don't know that you that you know that they did it you know i've had a couple of those you know i've uh it never fails you know as you know we have a very tight-knit family mm -hmm. i mean our my family's our kids are together all the time they yep. i don't when i say all the time i mean you know once a week at least now nah, once every other week we're probably together as a group and the family has expanded a lot anyway with that being said um, you know, every kid comes with his own package, his own, her own, uh, personality, her own, you know, and I've raised the four kids, uh, and each one of them have had their own, um, you know, w w w what one responds to well, the other one doesn't respond to it all. Mm. You know, every one of them has the magic key. And then you always have that one kid, maybe that you never could figure out that key. Mm. You know, which kid that is. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> You know, through time, you know, and, and then them surrounding themselves and you surrounding yourself and your family with, with people that, um, you know, that are qual what I would consider quality people. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if, if you want to be a bomb, hang around a bunch of bombs. Sure. You know, so I think it's always been important to us <clears throat> that we try to hang out with people that, um, you know, that you, you could parent my kid if, if you needed to, you know, if. If, if in my absence, if you need to say something to this kid, I, I'm confident that you can do that, mm. you know, so. And if I, I welcome it. And, right. Because yeah, right. it yeah. takes, you know, it takes a village. I mean, that's, that's a cliche, but it's so true. Mm. Um, early on, we figured out a couple things that we figured out. Um, one thing that we figured out is, is get, uh, get involved with, you know, I hate to say social media or whatever, but, you know. Christine, she is friends with Whitney's friends on Facebook. Sure. You know, I know I'm throwing names out there. I'm probably not supposed to do that. But point being is that's how you monitor, you know, get in your kids' lives mm -hmm. and stay in the middle of it. Yeah, it's kind of rude in the beginning. i tell you one thing. Um, we have this thing called Life 360. Now, I think I even introduced you to that back you years ago. Yep. And, man, that was so offensive to kids in the beginning. Oh, I can imagine. Oh, I couldn't imagine yeah. being a kid— 
I mean, obviously what? we didn't grow up with cell phones, but if I had a cell phone, yeah. I wouldn't carry my cell phone. No. If my dad knew where I was no. at all the time or my mom. <laughs> but, you know, this whole Life 360, when we first introduced it to our kids and it was introduced to us, they're like, no, nah, no, nah, no. Nah. But here's the thing. Yeah. Which, you know, you're paying for it. Right. You know, hey, you ain't got to, well, yeah. don't, don't have a phone. You didn't have a choice. But now, they're, they're, these kids are adults, yeah. except for, you know, one. And they still have like 360 yeah. now. You know why? Because they want to know where dad is. Sure. What's yeah. dad doing? Yeah. Where's mom? Where's sibling A, B, or C, or whatever? Right. So, you know, that was one thing that we figured out really quick is is to get involved and stay involved. And if you keep pounding that in, it becomes normal, like Life 360. You know, at first that was so offensive, but then it's like they're still using it and they're adults. Mm. The second thing that we, we figured out too is, you know, just play. You got to play. Mm. You know, um, we, there's been times through years, you know, that we bought a boat. Maybe we couldn't afford a boat. We figured out a way to buy a boat just so you could play. Yeah. Because when you play, they bring their friends with them. Sure. Right? Yeah. And it's not who's got the most toys wins. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is if you offer up that opportunity for them to be part of your life and have fun, mm. they want to be part of your life and have fun. You know, we camp, we boat, we water ski we learning you know how to board and do some other things and um you know or i could sit home on a couch because sometimes that's where i'd rather be yeah. right i mean working 70 or 80 hours a week i ain't got no energy for that mm. let's go to the lake sure you know <laughs> well you do that i mean because once i get there i'm having obviously a lot of fun but the more you can include your kids in what you're doing the more they're apt to follow in your footsteps and kind of you know Kind of take the good things that you're showing them, not all the bad necessarily. No, that want to be around you. Yeah, yeah, they want to be not around. not be forced to, because especially you know, like you said, they're right. old now. They ain't got to go. To, no. They ain't got to go down there. They ain't got to go. But to they lunch. sure want to. Yeah, yeah. they ain't got to yeah. go. And now it's like almost a schedule. We got to have a schedule. Not we can't come this weekend because right. You know, it's, it's cool uh, as we get older. You know that that that's become part of their life too. I mean, you know, our oldest she has her own camper now. You mm. know, and that's cool that that. The things that they learn in kids that that still applies to them and it's become important to their life too. So anyway, that's well, a little success. I mean, I think our kids are super successful. Don't get me wrong, but I think it's you know I got good kids. It ain't because of me, mm. right? I mean, they they've got a lot wow, of free don't will. Yourself. Well, come on, man. I'm ha I'm absent half the time. You know. Yeah, but it takes a strong. You know, if I think you hit on it a lot, and just in my opinion, you know. It all starts with you and your wife's relationship, you know. It does. <laughs> if there's if it's not strong there, then what you say might be totally different than what yeah. she's saying. Yeah. So then the kids confused, like, oh, okay, I'm gonna go talk to you because right. you know. Or, or, oh, kids or, are smart too. Oh, man. Yeah. They will work you against each other. I'm smarter I mean, than I ever gave them credit right. for. <laughs> they will. They're some of the biggest arguments that we've ever been in has mm -hmm. been because of the kids, you mm -hmm. know, because this one said that. There's that again. And this one says this. So anyway, it's a, um, yeah. Thanks for, yeah. We got we got good kids. Yep. Yeah. I ain't done yet though. I still got still got one and I haven't. And he's he's turned out just great. And I don't even know how to raise boys. I mean, I had three girls, and then all of a sudden, a boy. What yeah. do you do with this? <laughs> I kind of had the girls down. I kind of figured them out. But he is just a, he's a joy. He's easy. Yeah. Such a better kid than I was. Yeah, I know. That's <laughs> you know I say all the time, man. I mean, I don't know how what I would have done if I had to raise another me, man. No, I couldn't do it. Knowing what I know, that's not good. One of us would be in jail. <laughs> no <laughs> doubt, kid or me. You know what I mean? Right. So I mean, yeah, I think we both got very lucky. Yeah, um, I could have turned out a lot worse. Yeah, I mean, you know, we certainly gave that opportunity, you know, with being absent as much as we could or as much as we were. And, uh, yeah, it's definitely a blessing that they've turned out as good as they have. Yeah. So you talked about one of the things that you think helps us being involved in the church and everything. I mean, have you, me growing up, you know, I was in church every Sunday, man, as far as I can remember. Then, you know, my parents split up. Mm -hmm. That was like a not a really thing anymore. Right. <laughs> so from that point on, I really never— <clears throat> excuse me, went to church or really even thought about it. And I remember when I was real young, you know, you know, when you're young, you hear them up there, blah, 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 but you're not really paying right. attention. Well, for some reason, I heard the story with the, you know, 
what the preacher was saying, you know, we would have a, a son, or a Bible school it was like a week long. Yeah. And sorry, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it's and that, been a while ago. It has been a while. In that Sunday school that we went to, I'd ask our teacher or whoever they were. I was like, "Hey, preacher said blah 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 about." I'm like, "How's that? How's that possible?" And they're like, "Well, you have to have faith." And I'm like, "You know, right? What's that?" Faith, what do you mean? I'm just supposed to believe? Oh, yeah, you have to just believe. And from that time forward, just being a little kid, it just didn't make sense to me. I'm like, you know, I have to touch, feel, you know, figure something out on a piece of paper. Right. You know, it just never made sense to me, faith. I'm, and from that time, I was never very religious at all from that point forward. Because every time I would talk to somebody who had, you know, who who was in church quite a bit and, you know, Whenever I would ask them questions, I could never get an answer. You know, if it was a hard question, and we can go into that now, but probably not. But <laughs> um, I could never get an answer that satisfied me. Right. You know right. what I mean? I'm not saying what they were saying was wrong or right, and I never would accuse somebody of, oh, you believe the wrong thing. It's never been like that. It's mm -hmm. just I, at that point in my life, I never really, I couldn't get an answer. Right. That satisfied my curiosity, you know? Yeah. And so I was just wondering what, at what, I mean, has that always been in your life or was there a certain point, um, you know, your first kid, you know, that'll do it to you. Hey, you know, he needs to get in church and that kind of grew from there or yeah. where did that start for you? Well, it started in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad was a super um, religious, I'm going to, I'm going to call him religious. That's not really the word I like to use, but he had a, a strong faith and a personal relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that started from the very beginning. Um, so I was in church from day one and, quite honestly, didn't care for it either. You know, we went to a super small church. I'm talking, there might have been two or three kids there my age. Mm. I mean, on a good Sunday, we might have had 20. Wow. Right? That is not an environment that is conducive for a kid my age to learn or to believe, really. You know, I mean, I could, I could watch my dad and— it's like, what's he got? You know, what what is this? What is this? So it took many years, you know. Um, so I was probably into my teenage year. Well, actually, I was like nine when I when I first what I would what I would call got saved. Mm -hmm. I kind of walked away from it during my um, teenage years. And what I mean, walk, walked away from it. I didn't live the life that I should have lived. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I still believed. I've always believed, but um, you know, that became. Not a primary part of my life, but a secondary part of my life. Went through a lot of years, Bill. A lot of years that you know that was not important to me. I mean, I still had the knowledge. I still had the yeah. You know, if I died today, I think I know what's going to happen. But not living the life that would reflect that. Mm -hmm. And then I met somebody in there uh, in your house mm -hmm. that that kind of put a new perspective on it and put it back into using or not using, but um, living it. More living it instead gotcha. of just knowing it and having it in my head, actually living it and and seeing it, you know, up close and personal. So from the time she and I got together, you know, until today, I mean, we were in church, you know, the kids, every one of them, I think the first place they went <laughs> once they got out of the once they got out of the hospital, you know, the first place they went was probably the church. Mm. Um, it And it's, you know, it's just become and has been a part of our life for you know as long as i can remember yeah. so you know it's um i think it's important for everybody but one thing i've learned early on is i don't push it on anybody you know i mean we, we can talk and you may or may not know that i'm a christian mm -hmm. you know um I'll, if you ask me i'll tell you i am yeah but it's you know that's not that's not what i've ever seen as my uh that's not my part of servant mm -hmm. you know uh, i want to show you how i live i want to show you what i believe by how i live it's kind of been my motto, yeah. you know, right, wrong, or indifferent. So yeah. that's where we are. Yeah, I mean, yeah. when I say I kind of got away from all of it, which I did, and probably within man, probably within the last year, two, three, you know, I've that, that questions been popping up in my head yeah. quite a yeah. bit. Yeah, and um, you know, speaking to my son, who's very spiritual, right? Um, you know, I can't dissect these words, religious, spiritual, yeah. believe in this, believe in that. Right. I just know that he thinks there's a higher power. Oh, yeah. And, you know, he shared what his beliefs were. And I'm like, well, what about the, you know, and he's the first, first person who 
didn't get offended, yeah. well, other than you, because yeah. we've had these conversations, yeah. that didn't look at you like, you know, heathen, you know, or, <laughs> or, or whatever, you know what right. I mean? Just push you away, like, how could you think like that? You know, I'm telling you this, why, why are you not just listening? But explain to why they think like that. I guess that's the biggest thing, is um, how did you come to that conclusion? Right. Because right. I haven't been able to, you know yeah. what I mean? Right. Maybe what you're saying can help me understand some of the questions I have. Yeah. And so it's opened my mind a lot more than it ever was because for a while I didn't, I was a firm believer that there was not nothing right. like that. I mean, some, you know, the stuff that you see yeah, and the, stuff the that things that happen, you're like, right. Uh, it's impossible. Right. <laughs> you know, this great person that you say is here and this is happening. Yeah. Something ain't right. But, lot, you know, <clears throat> Even the paranormal or paranormal world, you know, and the investigation, stuff like that, you know, that some people believe or not believe. I've seen enough stuff to where I can't explain. Right. Well, if I can't explain that and I just saw it, how much more else is out there right. that I can't see and, you know, yeah. what is there? You know what I mean? And maybe that paranormal stuff that has come to me <clears throat> and shown itself is trying to trigger something in my head like hey you don't know everything dude right maybe you ought to open your mind up a little bit and and i and i've tried to with these past couple of years now i wouldn't say um i'm super religious or anything but i'm definitely open-minded and believe of something something yeah, outside something. of myself and that's that's and just a baby step world. that's step you know one I mean? yeah so you know I mean, I hate to say this because it sounds pretty rude, but I always thought people were just wasting their time. Yeah, and a lot of stuff that you see in the church, you know, especially in some of the churches going on. You know, I'm like, how can you people right. be dealing with that? You know, because those people, you know, they're just trying to get your money, and they're saying this and doing that. And I think I've come to terms that you know, religious is something that has to be individual. You can't get that from something else. You know. Um, although being in a church, I think it's a, a pretty good thing because it's a community. You have like-minded people. Right. Um, <clears throat> it's just, you know, you have one or two apples out there. It's going to run the whole batch sometimes. And that's what I've you know, come to terms to put in my mind that, hey, you know, I don't know everything like I think I do. Well, you know, you know the foundational problem to all of this is people. Well, it's absolutely. people. Right. We're broken people. Yeah. Right. All of us. Sure. Um, so, you know, when you say... Or people say the church, you know, the church did this, the church did that. Well, let's remember that the church is the people mm -hmm. and we are all broken. So, yeah, you talked about bad apples. All it takes is one or two, you know, to, to totally taint you towards whatever, you know, or it can also take one or two that, that says, hey, that flight suit is blue and they keep telling you that long enough and you might believe that it's blue. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the foundational problem is, is us, us people, you know, as a broken, as a broken people. Um, but you know, the way I kind of look at it is it's complicated. You know? Yeah. <laughs> they, none of us got all the answers. Yeah. And if you think you got all the answers, who you're lying to yourself because you know what, if the creator of all of this is as simple minded as me that I can understand it, then guess what? He ain't much of a God, mm -hmm. you know, he didn't create all this because I can't understand it. Yeah. Right. So, so much bigger scope, much more something it don't just fall together it just you know there wasn't a bang you know I, I, that, that's those are my opinions but what i try to do is not push my you know thoughts it, you know when you got questions you'll ask mm -hmm. you know when you're a seeker you'll seek and um you know and uh, that, that's always been my thing is i don't want to ruin my that's probably not the right wording but your sphere of influence are people that you know, you're around every day, you know, whether it be coworkers, family, extended family, whatever. And that sphere of influence is pretty tight, but it's very easy for you to uh, turn your back, so to speak, on or lessen your sphere of influence when you're so dominating in a way that you think, speak, act, believe. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you are a staunch atheist, for instance, and I'm a staunch believer and i start pushing 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 all i'm doing is pushing you away i'm not bringing you in right i'm going to bring you in to what i believe maybe by the way i lead my life by the way i talk by the way hey you need help uh, okay what, what do you need you know what how can i serve you how can i 
the way not to get to somebody is standing on the corner beating them down you know mm. um we're kind of experiencing that right now um, one of my kids has a has a uh, significant other that comes from a church that does that type of thing and that's acceptable mm. you know not that I'm not here to judge that. That ain't my issue. But right. but I know there's never been a person that I've ever seen that that took kindly to somebody standing on the corner in Cincinnati, you know, trying to preach the Bible, standing up on top of a whatever, a bunch of books, saying, you're going to hell. You, you know, you're not going to get to people like that. No. You know? They're not going to come to you, oh, please tell me more. It's just not the way it works. Sure. In today's day and time, you know, you can just about Google anything. You can have – you can – doesn't mean it's always true. All right. right. Yeah. Be careful yeah, with the sure. Google. Be, yeah. Google. be careful with the GTS. Yeah. You know, your GTS, anything, right? And it may or may not be true. So you kind of got to do your own research. And, you know, it's it takes time. And But, you know, it, it's just something that, for me, it's it was dwelt in me in the beginning. And, and I got away from it. And I came back to it. And, and it works. And I see it. I see it at work. You know, I've, I've seen miracles. I've, I've had miracles happened to me you know and there's no other explanation mm -hmm. absolutely no other explanation so with that being said you know i don't don't, don't want to make this be a podcast about oh, yeah, that no, but no. good conversation well you know this is about the questions i have yeah you know i yeah. hate to be selfish but i'll be selfish. It's stuff what i want i want to hear <laughs> yeah so totally you, cool yeah so what do you want to do in, what's your future plans in the next five ten years or do you oh, wow. see for like me i'm a, a year by year guy you know i don't really plan that far in advance maybe a couple of years at the most but uh i kind of play it by ear as it goes you got any goals that you want to do or? well you know I'm, i mean i'm 56 right so i'm not a spring chicken anymore even though my mind tells me i am my yeah, body says that horrible my body says nah i mean i got the mind of a 12 year old i'm like a little kid i know i got the humor of a 12 year old yeah, sometimes i'm like too. very immature and everything i know i'm so. told that regularly <laughs> but yeah it's um you know so i i, I don't you know i want to retire um uh, hopefully my body will make it doing this job until I'm 62. That's mm -hmm. kind of my goal. Once I turn 62, then I don't know. Honestly, uh, I, I don't like cold. Uh, it sucks. I get you. It hurts me. Yeah. Um, so I see warmth, <laughs> at least in the winter months. Mm -hmm. So does that mean a place in Florida? Maybe. Um, does that mean a place in Alabama? Maybe. I don't know. Somewhere warmer than Kentucky, I can tell you that. Yeah, it's pretty chilly up there. But our roots will always be in Kentucky as long as yeah. it's where our kids are. So. You know, I'm up to how many grandkids I got now. I mean, like I got like five or so. No, I got like five <laughs> grandkids. You know, and and I'm not going to get her away from the five grandkids. Right. Nor do I want to be away from them long term. You know, yeah. a couple months here and there. But hey, come see us. Where yeah. it's warm. So that's kind of my goal. Is yeah, if you build it, they will come. If the, good point, and that happens. You know, if you also if you buy it, they will come. That's what I'm saying. You no know? yeah. hot tub. Buy so you hot just tub, talked about the guess boat. What? Yeah. Hey, look what I got. Come over here and yeah. spend some time with me. Will you build uh, a big thing that's yeah. a little. Right, I mean, her, but I'm sorry, it works. Yeah, it works. But anyway, so you know, we're we're kind of like I can you. help you make that happen if you want to. What's so. that? You know, if you build it, they will come. Oh, okay. There's stuff around here. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Possibilities are endless. Yeah. But you know, I don't have. Um, it's very fluid at this point. You know, I keep yeah. thinking, oh, we got time. No, you don't. No, it's six years, man. Yeah, man, sure, it goes by fast. Don't yeah, it? it's going yeah. by just boom, 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 and you know, and, and like I said, my body's got a be able to tolerate this for another six years i think it can because doing the flight business you know uh, i can get a lot of help with that um i mean well, there's a lot not of, only that you probably you gotta pray you gotta be uh pretty fit and well what i mean by fit you have to be healthy to pass a flight do you guys gotta do no, flight physicals i'm not a pilot no oh you don't have I no can. i can have copd and have oh, yeah. you know pulse ox of 85 <laughs> percent. as long as i get my butt in the helicopter i'm good to go sweet yeah. okay no, uh -huh. that's just a pilot thing yeah uh, but I got to be able to lift patients, sure. right? Pilots yeah. don't necessarily have to do that. So, you know, I got to have a decent back and, you know, hips and knees. And so as long as that stuff holds up 62, maybe 63, we'll see. Um, but then, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to dial back. You know, I'm, I, you and I have a lot of the same. I don't think I'll ever be the guy that sits in a recliner. I'll work at Lowe's mm. or Home Depot or I almost applied there about three years ago. Not I mean, kidding. seriously, you know, I got to have something to occupy. You don't go from, you know, 70, 80 hours a week to zero, and that'd be very healthy either, mm. you know, not to mention on your relationship. Mm. She don't want to see me every day of the week. Yeah. You know, I mean, God, I know she loves me. There's no doubt about that. But I, so there will always be that transition. I'll always be, whether it, I might be volunteering in a hospital, I don't know, but I'll be doing something. Yeah.
Because I think when I quit, that's when I die. Yeah, pretty soon. I think that's what everybody, and they don't even realize it. Some, yeah. some people don't even realize it. You know, you stop moving. Well, you're going to stop yeah. moving, you know. Yeah. It doesn't take long either, too. You know, when you're at that age, if you don't keep your body parts moving and get, keep your mind figuring out problems and stuff that comes up, yeah. you become sedentary. And, you know, I've experienced this within the last, you know, year or two because working from home stuff, yeah, you're working from home, but, you know, you're working from home. So. Right. Not near as active as I should be. Right. And it's been like that for about a year or two. So um, just recently, you know, I've had some stuff happen where it's, hey, hey, dumbass. Yeah. You know, Can't move. <laughs> this Can't this move. ain't going to work. Right. So I immediately after that, when I once I felt up to it, you know, started hitting the gym again, hitting the treadmill, you know, there's plenty of stuff to do around here sure. in this property. Oh, this place is beautiful. Um, plenty of work. But I don't always want to do that. Right. So I want to do some, you know. I want to go push some weights up. You know what I mean? Cause, yeah. um, that's a manly. That's the that's a that's a manly thing. Well, it's not even about for me. It's not even about being big or being strong or anything like that. I just like to feel afterwards. Yeah. I like feeling sore. I know that sounds stupid, but I like endorphin like, release. Oh. Yeah. But then you're like, man, that, okay, yeah, yeah, that feels, feels a good workout. <laughs> so. It's the same reason I still man. to this day. I mean, I run two or three times a week. Yeah. I ain't running from nobody, and I ain't running to nobody, and yeah. I'm not doing it for speed. I just do it to get my heart rate up. Keep moving, and then after the fact, when you're sitting there, like, "Why do I do this?" and you're like, "All right, feel pretty good." Yeah, feel pretty good. Yeah, you know, as you wipe the sweat, and sweat off your brow. So. Do you keep your pool open all year? No, no, it's closed. So I have some people here, and you can even do it back home. You know where you're, where you're from. Um, they run their pool all year for a price. Well, from what I'm told, there's not that much of a price difference, just a little bit, because, you know, the price, you know, f comes when the start and the stop of the pump, right? But if it's continuously going, then it's not that, I mean, obviously there's an increased price, but it's not as significant if it was stopping and going. I don't like the pool enough. Well, here's <laughs> here's where I'm going with this. Where are you going? So, have you ever done a cold plunge? That sounds wicked. No. It's horrible. Yeah. But you got to try at least once. Why would I do that? Because, and I've been trying to talk my wife into getting one here, but we have a pool, but I haven't kept it open all year yeah. because we got just too many leaves. You know, I'm not, it's, I deal enough with it during the summer. Right. I don't want to deal with my stuff right. in the winter. No. But it would be the perfect atmosphere to have that cold plunge if it was running all year because, you know, the temperature, it'd probably get, the pool would probably get right where it needs to be around 34, 35 wow. degrees. So when you go in a cold plunge, you don't go in there for like 10, 15 minutes. You go in there for like minutes. So you like die for just a second, and then you jump back out. Well, you know, when you come back out, it's it's like a kickstart to everything. The energy levels, the the focus on your brain. I mean, there's so many more benefits. There's a lot of benefits from that. That's because of the near-death experience you just had. <laughs> right. So it's like a, about a minute or two of suck, but the benefits last for, you know, three or four hours throughout the day. So and what you're saying is embrace the suck. Embrace the suck. Okay. You know, nothing good comes without going through some kind of pain. I don't care what it is. Oh, you're right. You have to go through some type of pain, whether it be medical, metal, uh, mental, physical, uh, whatever you want to call it. But you have to go through the suck to get to the good. Yeah, that's that's quotable. I think. Yeah, that's quotable. <laughs> we Everything in my down. life, I've had to be in the suck before anything oh, that's good happens. Absolutely. So, Agreed. Yeah. Well, hey, man, I think we've been at it long enough. You got anything you, else you want to talk about? You got any questions for me? No, or man, no. All right. I don't think so. Well, I appreciate you coming down, man. You're welcome here anytime. Appreciate that. All right, bye. See you, man. All right. Bye.